Yeah, that's better. All right, so some people might know me. John knows me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jake, Jake Friesen. And uh, I was asked to bring a teaching here today, and the Lord kind of put it on my heart to uh, to give you a teaching that I've called uh, How to Stay Filled with God. And that's a, a teaching that I've I've done before. Some people might have heard it before, some people not. But it's a teaching that I've called How to Stay Filled with God. I believe that there's people in this room and, and also people online and so on that will wonder what is the life like to continuously be filled with God. And you know, one of the things that's interesting about life is uh, life sometimes makes us skeptical. Uh, our life experiences makes us skeptical. And some of the times we're not going to see everything in this life come to pass. Not that it's not God's will for it to come to pass, but sometimes there's things in the way that stop it from coming to pass. God has given us an abundant life, but sometimes there's blocks in it that stop it. So my question that I have asked myself sometimes and have asked other people is how is it that after that first excitement of being born again, we kind of lose that fire. Or that first excitement, that first encounter with the Holy Spirit, we lose that attention span to the Holy Spirit. We lose that fire after winning this battle of addictions. I believe that there's an answer. I believe the Word of God has an answer. Yes. And I think it's actually very interesting. There's four things that I want to point out today. And it all comes from one verse. I want to turn to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans is a very interesting book. And I've always loved the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, there's four things that I want to point out from, from Romans chapter 1, verse 21. And in these four things that I want to share on tonight, I believe that there is a huge revelation that we can all take hold of. It says, uh, Paul was talking to believers here. It says, because they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. So those, there are four things. They did not glorify God. They weren't thankful. Their imagination became darkened. Or they became, their imagination became uh, vain. And their heart was darkened. So those are four things that I want to kind of uh, point on uh, today. And I believe with those four things, we can see a greater explanation with how to stay filled with, filled with God. Glorify is a word that I couldn't understand for a long time. It was one of those Bible words that was just over the top of my head. I couldn't understand it. And so I started looking into what it meant, glorify. The glor in, in the Greek and Hebrew, I did more research and it made me, uh, made, made me understand it better. But to glorify means to render or to esteem. And the word esteem means to place value. Did you know that you place value on things every single day? You place value on things whether you realize it actually or not. Sometimes we value going to work more than spending more time in the Word of God. But we must value what God speaks to us and how he speaks to us more than anything in life. Even if it doesn't make sense at all in the moment. When God speaks to you, value that. Place honor and value on that in your time of guidance, 
and in your time of need. I remember in 2017 when I was going through a very rough time in my life, and this is my personal testimony, and from this testimony birthed ministry in me. I was looking for the Lord to provide a way out of my misery. I was in a four and a half year relationship and I knew for a fact that this was not God's will for my life. And in the culture that I was in, I had done everything right. I had been born again, I had had water baptism, I bought a house. Now the only thing that was in the, that was missing in this culture was to get married. And God told me exactly opposite. He said, leave this relationship. I was in a church and in, the, oh no, sorry. I was in a, I had a dream. I was praying to the Lord and I said, Lord, show me what you want me to do. And in this dream, the Lord spoke to me in a dream and he said, leave, I'm leaving, leave this relationship and I'm going to prepare someone better for you. Now, this had to cost me something. After living with something for four and a half years, that's all I knew. And I had to value what God spoke to me. And when, after a couple months of me meditating and thinking about this, I committed an action to what God did spoke to me, and I valued his word. People didn't understand. Family came out against me. Friends came out against me. And I didn't care. I didn't share this dream with anyone. It was personal. It was very, very personal. And I just let it be. And I figured if God spoke it, I'm going to value it, and I'm going to glorify God, even if it means that everybody's coming out against me. I magnified what God did to, get, did to me in that dream. Magnify, a magnifying glass. You know, you can, God is God regardless of how big you think he is. And a magnifying glass, you can make things bigger. You can make God bigger in your life. God is not getting bigger, but you can make God bigger in your life. And whatever you focus on gets bigger. You know, sometimes when we're, going, when we're having a bit of a rough day, I think the devil kind of uses like a toothpick. And we focus on this little, little toothpick, and we magnify it, and we magnify it, and we magnify it. And all of a sudden, at the end of the day, we have focused on this little toothpick so much that we magnify it to a baseball bat and the devil's just beating our brains out and really it's only a toothpick. We magnify things too much. Thankfulness is point number two that I want to focus on a little bit. Thankfulness should not be an obligation. Did you know that you cannot worry and complain about problems and praise God about it at the same time. You will do one of the other, one of the two, but you cannot do both at the same time. Psalm 104 says, you enter into his court with praise and thanksgiving. It says you enter, not someone else for you. You have to enter that on your own. You enter into his court with praise and thanksgiving. Thankfulness should be a lifestyle something that I wake up with, something I take to bed with throughout my day and declare over my life. It's a privilege, actually. It's a responsibility. It's an, it's an uplifter. Did you know that it actually costs you zero dollars and zero cents to be thankful? You know, those, those, that is one of the few... Th yeah, yeah. Being thankful...
cost you zero dollars and zero cents to be thankful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of the very, very few things that is 100% and absolutely free in this life, even if interest rate is at 6%, diesel at a dollar seventy. Thankfulness costs you zero dollars and zero cents if you do it from the heart. Paul was consistently thankful, even though he had more hardship than anybody that we've ever met. Thankfulness should be a lifestyle, and it's a key ingredient to being continuously full of God. Because when we're thankful, we're not focusing and complaining about a problem. Imagination is point number three that I want to kind of talk about. I think when we talk about imagination, I know already that there is people that already are starting to think about imagination. I think that there is a very large uh, misconception about the imagination. And I think we have, sometimes we have thought of imagination as being a bad thing. Imagination is not fantasy. Imagination, God gave you. And I want to tear into a little bit more about imagination. And I believe that at the end of this, you will have a greater understanding about your imagination. We see ourselves incorrectly. And therefore, we aren't as full of God as we could be. In your imagination, you must see yourself victorious on the inside before you see it on the outside. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Did you know that healing does not come from the outside in? It comes from the inside out. So is your imagination, the way you think, the way you meditate, the way, the way that you look at life. It's your imagination. And it's how you manifest things on the outside. I want to turn to Numbers, chapter 13. I want to talk about imagination here. Uh, I'll ch- Numbers, chapter 13, from 27 to... 33. I'll skip 28. Verse 27. And they told him and said, We came into the land where milk and honey flows. And surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people, the people be strong and dwell in the land, and the cities are walled with very and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And I'll skip 29, uh, verse 30. And Caleb still stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Listen to this, verse 31. But we, but the men, went up with them and said, they are stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched out the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search is a land that eats the inhabitants thereof. For all the people that we saw, keyword saw in there, are men and are of great stage stature, and we saw it in our men of a great sorry. No, and there were there we saw giants, the sons of Enoch, which come of giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They saw themselves as grasshoppers in their imagination. Did you know that this was before they ever went to battle? They only searched there. 
They were only spying. They never touched ground on the battlefield. But this was their imagination. And out of that imagination, they saw themselves defeated. They saw themselves being the loser, being the head and not the tail. Imagination has some very interesting words that are linked to the word imagination. Did you know that for the word imagination is another word for the word mind? Isaiah 26, 3. The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose what? Mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. Mind and imagination, they're the same word, but sometimes they, they get interchanged in, in Scripture. But if you trace those words back into the Greek and Hebrew, they are the identical word. The word for mind, imagination, or meditate. Meditate is another word for imagine, another word for mind. It's the Greek word yetzer, Y-E-T-S-E-R, translates imagination. To meditate means to imagine. Not meditate is another thing that we a lot of the time have a wrong perception of. We think of meditate as someone doing yoga. That's not correct. Meditate is you meditating and remembering and rehearsing what the Lord has for you. Or when you are memorizing scripture, you are, what are you doing? You are meditating. You are remembering. You are reminding yourself of promises of God in your life. Or, or for example, if you're looking at, uh, let's say you need healing in your body, and you want to learn more about healing. Okay, well, what does the scripture say on, for, on healing? Well, First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, By his stripes you were healed. You meditate, you remind yourself, you, you build up your, med- your, your mind, your meditation, you imagine yourself healed, healed. And so, I hope you understand a little bit more about the imagination, that there's different words that Scripture uses to help you highlight what he's trying to communicate with you through imagination from Romans chapter 1. Um, we, a lot of the time, we have an identity crisis. And we see that in Scripture as well. We see a lot of people, they, have, they had an identity crisis, even though they, what they had was right in front of you. Do you know what this is? This is ID. This is my driver's license. And sometimes when we don't have a correct imagination our identity becomes distorted. And we act out on a false identity. We proclaim false identities when we don't have the correct one. Not a stolen one, an incorrect one. Did you know, I'm going to try to make you work here a little bit. I know sometimes you just want to be encouraged, but I believe that this will be a blessing to you. Your imagination, I'll go to touch this on a little bit again. Your imagination, did you realize that your imagination is working for you 24-7 a day, whether you realize it or not? If, you, if somebody gives you a phone call and, and for example, uh, you lost your wallet and you need to explain to them where your wallet is in your house, you don't, did you know that you do, not, you do not have to be in your house to explain where your wallet is? You go into your imagination and you explain to them where it is. Open this door, turn two corners, left door on the right, or left, left side table, whatever. You know what I mean. You use your imagination. If I say to you, imagine a pink cat. You imagine, what do you imagine? A pink cat. Right? Did you know that you could, you could be, in your imagination is life. You could be 
inches away from water and dying of thirst, but you ne if you never open the tap, you'll die of thirst. And one of the things that, that stops that is, there, is, is your imagination. It's not up to God on how full of him we are. God has given us complete freedom and complete choice and authority over how full of God we want to be. It is not up to God on us always being full. God has given us a unique capability and a gift. And he has given us the keys to control of how full of God we are. Uh, point number four, uh, don't let your heart be darkened. Uh, I'll touch on Ephesians chapter four. Verse uh, 17 through 24. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. See, in other, there's that word mind again, imagination. Don't walk in the, in the imagination of the, as the Gentiles did. Having their, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is within them. Because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling and have given themselves over to lasciviousness to walk in all uncleanness and, and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so, then you have heard of him and have been taught by him as the truth that is in Jesus. And uh, verse 24, And that ye put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 and 11 is another one that I'll, that I'll touch on. Uh, for ye were sometimes in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of, the, of that light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So, don't let your heart be darkened. Don't let your imagination be darkened. Don't have your mind distorted. Don't have your identity in the, in the Lord be distorted. Did you know that... Uh, I'm going to try to make you imagine again here a little bit. Uh, imagine God's presence as like a dove. We often refer to the dove as the Holy Spirit. Imagine whatever I do, and if there's a dove on my shoulder, whatever I do influences that dove on my shoulder. Being aware of God's presence is kind of like that. Every movement you make influences that. One of the very interesting things about the dove, the Holy Spirit, did you know that there is nine main feathers for that dove? Those nine main feathers are the gifts of the Spirit. And the, and the five main feathers of that dove are the fivefold ministry. And what you do influences that dove, that Holy Spirit. And it's up to us to create a welcome environment to that dove, to the Holy Spirit. In the same way that the Holy Spirit lives, on, lives in us, it is our responsibility to live in that way that honors and respects him. And one of those ways is 
to also to continuously stay filled with God. The Holy Spirit is a unique, unique person, and he's not power, he's a friend. Power is part of him, but you need to know him as a friend. I think one of the main, one of the big things that often stops us from being full, of, uh, continuously being filled with God is we compare ourselves to other people. First Corinthians or Second Corinthians ten verse twelve says, "Do not be, do not don't compare yourselves among themselves for themselves by themselves. Don't compare yourself to somebody else." We are all on us on a, on an each on an we are all on an, on a level of faith that somebody else might not be on and and your journey is unique in itself it's about having a personal relationship with the lord and if if we com- compare ourselves to somebody on on youtube or some guy on podcast uh, it's it's discouraging some of the time, even though that whatever they're saying is encouraging. But if we magnify on that too much, we meditate on that too much, it becomes discouraging. It's about having a personal relationship with the Lord. And, and it's not about having a competition with somebody else. It's not about uh, being competitive with signs and wonders. Even, even though I believe in signs and wonders, I believe in speaking in tongues, I do speak in tongues. I've seen many miracles happen. I've seen demons being cast out, people healed, people speak in tongues. I believe all those things. And I practice them openly, and I'm not afraid of them. But it's, it's, not, it's not a race. It's not a competition. It's not a, it's not a competition on who can be more filled with God. It's about having a personal relationship with the Lord. And it's important to have good friends in your, in your life and somebody that, that you can personally be accountable with and, and lift you up and, and, and be filled with God. But it's about having that personal relationship with the Lord and, and, and to be glorifying God, to be thankful, to have the right imagination and don't let your heart be darkened. And, and one of the hardest things that you'll ever do in your life is, is to retrain your brain Stinking thinking keeps you sinking. Your thought life determines your direction. Your thoughts are more powerful, I think, than you've ever imagined. The way you think dictates your life. And the hardest thing that I think you'll ever do is retrain your brain. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One of the things that you have to do, and I think this is just a bonus fact, or Holy Spirit rabbit trail, one of the two, is you have to retrain your brain. Transform your mind. That's literally one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in my life, is retrain my brain to think in the proper ways of the Lord. And it will, it, will, it will cost you something. Did you know that following Jesus or believing in Jesus will cost you nothing? Following Jesus will cost you everything. And part of that cost is renewing your mind. And that will take serious discipline, dedication, and commitment. But the ultimate fruit that will come out of that is an absolute and abundant life. That will come from that. But I tell you that that is a very, very, very few people that will actually take the time seriously and retrain your brain. But as long as you live the way that you live, you will. But when you get to a point of, I'm not living like this anymore, and in the name name of Jesus, I will not live like this, and I will change. It starts with your thought life, the way you think. And sometimes you got to go extreme, extreme measures to do that. For me, personally, my, my, my story is I, I, got, I had got a book. And in this book, it, it showed me how to, re, how to retrain your brain on thinking. And I, I took this book religiously, like to the max. And I started doing... Everything in this book. Now, this book was called Joyce Meyer, Power Thoughts. 
and I took this book religiously. I went to the max. I prayed over it, and I started using those applications in my life. And there was a couple things that the Lord did to me. For, for one was he delivered me, and I, I had got this special place, this private place that I started building with the Holy Spirit. And that was my bed. My bed. My old bed. Very, very, very personal to me. I still have this bed. I never sleep in it. but It's very personal. That was my private life with God. That bed. I had had a lot of trauma and hurt in that bed. But the night that the Lord healed me and fully restored me became my favorite place with the Lord. And that bed was so special to me. And that, be, that bed was part of my transformation of my mind. And it took time and dedication to it. Another thing was where a lot of my transformation happened in my mind was in my car. I had an old Honda car. John remembers that one. And I had that thing anointed up to the max. If that thing was in the physical, if everything in the physical realm would go, that thing would still go supernaturally. Praise God. But that thing was another private thing in my life that, that I used very personally to transform my mind. I, I put things, I had um, some work gloves and I literally just tattooed them with scripture. And I would go through all day and I would start renewing my mind. And, I, and I, I lost friends at work. I lost people at my workstation. They left me. Everybody on my table, they left me at, at, on lunch breaks. And I didn't care. I figured, whatever, I don't care. Do your thing. But I loved, you know, this transformation. And I started getting more and more aggressive on it. And after a period of time, I started realizing, hey, you know what? This stuff works. You're not thinking about this stuff anymore. All of a sudden, I, I realized that, you know what? Pornography is no big deal if you have a renewed mind. And you can start thinking away the way, according to the word of the Lord. And so it, it's, it starts with, with uh, glorifying God, being thankful, don't let, and having your imagination working for you, not against you. And don't let your heart be darkened in renewing your mind. But uh, and that's part of it. And it's probably the hardest thing that you'll ever do. But I tell you one thing, that if, if you commit yourself to it, in whatever way that will look like for you, I think it will look like different for everyone. But in whatever way that will look like, it's about having a personal relationship with the Lord and doing whatever it takes. In case of Ross or Rob, whatever it will be, what people, it just is what it is. And you have to value that, and you have to place honor and respect on that. And so anyway, I think that's about all that I will share today. And um, I hope this, uh, I hope this uh, helps you a little bit on, on you know, the question on, on how to stay filled with God. I know many of the time we, we often go to uh, conferences or we go to uh, big church events and stuff like that, which I'm not against. But after a while, we lose that a little bit, in a sense, so to speak. And even though those are all good things, but there should be something more on the side in your private life with God that will continuously keep you full of God. When people look at you and they wonder, what's up with this guy? Well, how is he so different? He's always happy. He's always filled with God. It takes time and dedication. But God will openly reward you for it. And the people that God will bring to you from that, you can help. Did you know that God has given you two hands? One to receive from God, the other one to give. And I don't want to hold anybody up from receiving that miracle that I have received from God. And this is just part of it that I'm sharing with you guys. So I just hope that this is a blessing to you guys. And, uh, and I pray that there will just be fruit of it. And I pray that you will begin to reflect on this. And uh, yeah, so that's about it. Hey, thank you very much. That was powerful. Staying full of God. Staying full of God.
creates fruit. Galatians 5, 21 says, the fruit of the Spirit. There's nine gifts, you said, nine spiritual gifts. Do you know there's nine? The fruit of the Spirit is nine, there's nine things. There's nine things. But it doesn't say nine fruits. It says fruit. It doesn't say nine different kinds of fruits. It says the fruit of the Spirit. Like Jake says, staying full of God produces the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't fruit. There's nine gifts. Gifts are nine. But nine fruit. There's the fruit of the Spirit are these nine things. It's only a fruit. Those are not beans. That's, if you have a basket of fruit, that's the, you call it a basket of fruit, right? Why would we have fruit? What, what's the purpose of us having fruit? What is the purpose of it? Yes. So, if I have spiritual fruit, Jake eats from it. I don't know you long enough, so I couldn't say that you have eaten of my, maybe some. But Jake eats of this fruit. What kind of fruit do we eat? The people we hang out with, what kind of fruit do they have? That's what I eat. If I go hang out with Jake and he's not living a good lifestyle, I eat his fruit and I'll be contaminated. He's full of drugs, full of lies, full of cussing and swearing. I eat this fruit and I've, I will be contaminated. And I'll go home and I'll be confused. That's why it's very important who do you hang out with. The fruits are not for myself. The fruits are for you. You ate some of Jake, Jake's fruit today. I know him since 2007. 17. He's a true man of God. We ate some of his fruit today. Have you ever thought of it that way? Praise the Lord. If anybody, if you, you guys need healing or anything, you can come to the front. This guy will, Adam will turn on the worship music and Jake will be praying for us. If anybody needs prayer, he'll be praying. Want to turn on the worship music now? 